chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about malicious memories. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. And tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Dirk Stevens is voice talent Paul J. McSorley. Hey, that's me. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our tale this evening is written by Dirk Stevens and is performed by myself, Paul J. McSorley. Folks, this story features elements of child abuse, attempted murder, and alcoholism. I just wanted to give a heads up before we get into this one. We hope you stick around with us, but understand if you cannot, and we'll see you at the next episode. Maybe check out an archived episode of Fear from the Heartland in the meantime. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Transgressions. Time flows on, as it always does. The pale pink hues of morning fade to blue sky, then melt to soft rose as Saul continues his journey west. Over and over, season after season like the hands of some great clock, each cycle different, but always the same. Today was no different. The dawn heralded his coming. He stood proud in the noonday sky. And now I lay in bed watching him go, taking his light, his warmth with him. And here I am, left once again to the mercy of the creatures of the night, memory and despair. And still time continues its march. One by one, pinpricks of light pierce the veil of night, the vanguard of Luna's forces. More follow, more than anyone can count, more than the grains of sand upon the shore. Until at last, Luna herself appears. She fills the world with her ethereal splendor. Dim and mysterious, it pours through my bedroom window like molten silver, spills onto the floor and floods each crevasse with her haunting glow. Another day gone and still no sleep. I roll over, turning my back to the moonlight. Luna, I snort, will-o'-wisp that she is. She has no light of her own, only a twisted reflection of soul's brilliance. Her subjects, a faded mockery of the waking world, Shadows only. Ghosts. Shivering, I pull the blanket up over my head. I know it's futile. That it's a shield as false as Luna's light. It can't protect me. Nothing can. But like Saul, like Luna, my course is fixed. My end assured. So here I cower, like a frightened child, haunted by the incessant drumbeat of time. A rhythm that haunts my every thought, that chips away at my sanity like a miner's pick. 
unheard in Saul's passing, but deafening in the silence of Luna's grace. The footsteps of fate. The echoes of doom measured by the soft ticking talk of the clock my grandfather passed to me when he died. The clock his father fashioned for him on the day of his birth. The clock that ticked away every second of his long life. That stopped cold the moment he died and refused to mark another second. No matter the horologist's ministrations. Now alive, without winding, without coaxing, it refuses to fall silent. Even after the fury I unleashed upon it with my axe, its heartbeat pounds on, its face, glass and wood unmarred. A nemesis I cannot be rid of. And oh, how I've tried. No one will buy it. No one will take it. Even those that did come, drawn by my ad online, could barely bring themselves to look at it, much less touch it. As if the clock itself exudes some hidden light that blinds the inner eye. They left without so much as uttering a sound. When all else failed, I loaded it into the back of my Peugeot and drove it to the landfill. With a sigh of relief, I watched it roll down the side of a heap of garbage, slam into an old bedspring, and bounce out of sight. My heart sang as I drove home, only to find it where it stands now, off the foot of my bed, undamaged, still ticking. But its tone changed that day, deepened, so that each tick echoes through my very soul. I can no longer bring myself to touch it. Even the thought squirms from my mind like a terrified worm. And somehow, I know that if I moved, if I sold this house or simply left, it would follow me. Two chimes, thick and heavy, slice through the silence of the night, cold as death's own scythe. My hand gropes through the sheets, searching for her, for comfort, but find only the cold shell of what was. She's not there. Of course not. My arm curls tight against my chest. She's where she always is at this time, dragged from her rest by the demons I gave her, haunted by the pain I caused. Three heartbeats of the clock pass in silence. I lift my head from the pillow, my ears probing the darkness between ticks. Four. Five. The furnace rumbles to life. Six. The hushed whistle of wind whines against the eaves beyond my window. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Silence. Licking my lips, I slip the blanket down past my nose. Something's changed. A dim glimmer of hope sparks to life deep within my chest. She's never gone this long past the chime. Eleven. My ears ache with the strain of listening. Twelve. I jolt upright. She's not playing. She's not there. Heart pounding, I toss the blankets aside, flop my legs over the side of the bed, and jam my toes into my slippers. But then I hear it. A single note, soft and low, sounds from the piano downstairs. It dances through Luna's domain like a forlorn howl, followed by the first chords of her favorite song. Our song. The flame in my chest turns to ice, a biting cold that surges through my veins in pulsating shards. Eyes burning, I collapse back onto the pillow and wrap myself in a cocoon. But I can't swallow the tears. I can't undo what I've done. Her playing grows louder, loud enough to drown even the ticking of the clock. My own stifled sobs, my whispered pleas for mercy, for forgiveness my broken declarations of love. And I do love her. More than anything, I always have. Ever since we were children. Before I even knew what love was. The girl next door, whose mother was always falling or running into things, who always wore long sleeves and sunglasses to hide the bruises. The woman whose breath smelled funny, whose eyes never smiled. 
The notes linger on, and again, I'm drawn back to the morning that changed everything. The morning I stood beside my bed, staring at a row of Polaroids laid out on the sheets. Cool leaves, clouds, a weird bug, and her. But I wasn't sure which one she'd like. It's five till. Out the door, mister. Mom's last warning. Coming. With a single motion, I swept the pictures into a pile, closed them safely inside my trapper keeper, and ran outside as fast as I could, jamming everything into my backpack as I bolted out the door. I made it to the corner, just as the bus rolled to a stop. The other kids from the neighborhood were already waiting when I arrived, but not her. I squinted back up the block, wondering if I should have waited for her. But I barely made it as it was, and missing the bus was one rule I knew better not press. The doors folded open, the other kids shuffled onto the bus ahead of me. I tossed one last glance toward her house, and her front door burst open. Yes! I jumped up the steps and tugged the driver's sleeve. She's not sick. She's just not running so fast. Don't leave without her. If he responded, I didn't hear it. I skipped down the aisle, flumped into my usual spot, and flopped my bag on the seat beside me. It was her seat, and hers alone. Even if she was sick, it was still hers. A few seconds later, her head poked up over the railing. She thanked the driver for waiting and slumped down the aisle. Hey! I snatched my bag, flopped it on my lap, and opened the zipper. I got him! Her mouth twisted into a strange frowning pucker as she sat down, but she didn't answer, didn't look at me. I slipped out my trapper, ripped open the Velcro, and spread out the pictures so she could see them. Which one you want? She leaned over and pressed her finger against the edge of the picture I took of her last week on the playground. Her knees bent below the swing, hair trailing behind her head like a kite tail, eyes bright and smiling. She pinched the corner and lifted it from the rest, but she didn't say a word, only brushed her hair down below her ear. I stared at the picture, her face, and smiled. It almost seemed to capture the sound of her laugh, the taste of the ice cream we had when we got home. That was a good day. She nodded. A dark purple spot, bigger than my thumb, peeked out from under her hair as she moved. Just seeing it made my neck hurt. What happened? She dropped the picture and tugged her hair forward before the words even left my mouth. I caught her hand. You getting clumsy like your mom? She jerked away. Her chin shook, and without a single word, she ran to the back of the bus. I didn't follow. She didn't speak to me at all that day. No matter how many times I said I was sorry. That I really liked her mom. That I didn't mean anything. She wouldn't listen. The sound of the piano shatters the memory. I roll over and bury my face into the pillow, hating myself for what I said. It doesn't matter that I was seven. She was hurting. I should have known. I should have been more sensitive. I don't know what was worse, being hated by my best friend or seeing her red eyes, watching her chin shake and not knowing why or what happened not being able to help. I didn't know the hell her mother lived with every day, how she drank to numb the pain, how hard she worked to keep her daughter safe. I was seven. Life was about catching frogs and bugs, making rocket ships out of old refrigerator boxes. I didn't, couldn't know what she was going through, that sometimes grown-ups hide what they are, that they act nice, but sometimes... They're really monsters. All I knew was my best friend was hurting, and I couldn't even ask why. I went to bed early that night and stared out across the yard to her bedroom window opposite mine at her drawn curtains. I tried reaching her on the walkie-talkie, but she didn't answer. Instead, her room went dark. I couldn't sleep, not with that tingly, empty feeling in my stomach. I just laid there, staring at the ceiling, at the Transformers poster hanging over my bed, wishing I could turn into something else too. Something that wasn't me. Someone that knew what to do or say, who didn't always mess everything up. 
someone she'd forgive. A flicker of light danced across the robot's eye. I blinked. Another yellow flash, brighter than the last, lit up the whole poster. I sat up. A shaft of light pricked at the corner of my eye, drawing my attention to her bedroom window. To the flames dancing up her curtains. I ripped the blankets from my bed and raced down the stairs screaming, Fire! Fire! Mom and Dad's door cracked open as I sprinted past. Dad shouted something and I was in the yard, running as fast as I could. Flames were already licking out the window when I reached her front porch. I grabbed the knob with both hands, turned and pushed the door open. Smoke rolled across the ceiling like low-hanging clouds in winter. I didn't think. I didn't feel. I ran. Up the stairs to her room through the open door and stopped. Fire covered the walls and ceiling. But it wasn't that, nor the indescribable heat against my cheeks and hands that stole my breath. No. It was the blood. The sight of her Care Bear comforter soaked red that stopped my heart. The twitch of her arm that started it again. I jumped forward, grabbed her by the wrist, turned and ran. Or tried to. Her body fell from the bed, but she didn't stir. I turned around, grabbed her other hand and pulled. Her body slid across the carpet. I backed up and pulled again. Over and over. Through her door and down the hall to the stairs. The flames roared like an angry lion. The heat, the smoke, clawed at my throat. I couldn't breathe. Head spinning, gasping, I stepped down two stairs and pulled her. Her body slipped over the top and tumbled down. She slammed into my legs. I fell back. And then nothing. Voices mumbled somewhere at the edge of hearing. Noises that slowly coalesced into words, jumbled and meaningless. Words that slowly began to make sense, but not a voice I knew. Not a human voice. Too deep. Too disjointed. No, you go. I'll sit with him. Blinking, I forced my eyes to open. Blinding white light cascaded all around a shapeless mass of color. A mass that spoke with a voice I recognized. Dad's voice. Hey. I blinked but his face refused to come into focus. Dad? I raised my hand to rub my eyes, but something kept my arm from moving. I glanced down at my hand, but everything was a blur of white cloud. I can't move. Dad cleared his throat. It's all right. Everything's going to be fine. My eyelids drooped. The theme song to The Polka Dot Door played softly in the back of my mind. Tingles of color tickled my body, filling every pore with numb sweetness, like sleeping in a bed of cotton candy. Clowns danced to music played by elephants and otters, but one thought pierced through the drug-induced chaos. Her. I jolted up as far as the restraints allowed. Is she okay? It's okay. Dad's gentle hand pressed against my shoulder. She's going to be just fine. You're both going to be just fine. Rest. My body slumped back into the pillow. She was fine. Chaos closed in around me, and I didn't fight it. She was fine. Nothing else mattered. Later, after initial treatment, Dad told me how he stopped to put on his pants when I ran outside. How he shouted for Mom to call the fire department and chased after me, right into the inferno. How he found us in a tangled mass at the bottom of the stairs, unconscious, her on top, the side of my head pressed against the burning carpet, some polyester blend that melted and congealed against my skin, that clung to my cheek and claimed my ear, and that the doctors bound my hands to keep me from touching the bandages as I slept, to keep me from toying with them when I woke. I don't know how long it was before I saw her again. Days? Weeks? Time holds no sway in hospitals, at least not for patients. Sleep comes at the whims of the chemicals being pumped into your arm and not as Saul's departure. Only the different faces of your caretakers hint that any change has taken place at all. But even those pass in waves of disjointed thought and half-remembered dreams. It was a new face that changed that. 
one that arrived as the painkillers began to release their hold on my mind. A kind, round face. That of a woman who took me for walks between treatments, who brought me toys and asked about my feelings. But it wasn't me I wanted to talk about. It was her. I badgered the woman endlessly about her. My friend, how she was, if I could write her a note, if I could see her. Eventually, the woman relented. She took me to a room with a wooden fort along one wall. A room littered with plastic balls, games, and tables with colored wooden beads that slid over tangles of wire fastened to their tops. She sat me down beside one of these, told me to wait, then went and spoke to a nurse sitting behind a window and left. I flopped my arm on the table beside the mass, laid down with my bad ear up, and flicked at a blue bead fastened around a red wire. Watched it slide up and fall back to the others with a dull click, all the while stealing sidelong glances at the pudding cup I brought for her. The only thing I had to give. My dessert from lunch. It wasn't enough. I flicked the bead back up the wire. I wished mom and dad had brought me my camera. I could have taken a picture of that bird yesterday, the one that sat on the ledge outside my window. The bead clicked back against the others. She'd have liked that. The door cracked open and the round-faced woman stepped back into the room. I lifted my head. There she was, peeking at me around the woman's pants with wide, frightened eyes, a thick white bandage around her neck. Heart pounding, I snatched the pudding and jumped up from my chair. Hey! The woman stepped aside. Hey! Her gaze flicked to the side of my face, to the bandage where my ear used to be, and then at the floor. But the way she stood, with her hands behind her hospital gown, her voice so small and raspy, stabbed at my heart like hot needles. I needed to do something, and so I handed her my cup. I saved you some pudding. Her eyes shone when they found mine. Her lips twitched, and for a moment, I was back on the bus, waiting for her to run. Except, she didn't. Her cheeks flushed and she looked away. A slow smirk spread across her face. Her hand crept out from behind her back and around her side. Her fingers clasped around a little plastic cup just like mine. The pudding she saved for me. And just like that... Everything was good again. We spent a lot of time visiting one another's room, swapping desserts, playing in the fort room, as much as the nurses would allow. It wasn't until years later that I learned what really happened that day. Some of it I pieced together from bits of conversation I overheard, my own memories, and what she told me. The rest I read decades later in the police reports, when the scars of her past resurfaced. When I went searching for answers, for help, the piano falls quiet, its notes soft and distant meld with the drumbeat of the clock. A shudder ripples down my arms, into my chest, and sticks to the back of my throat. But time marches on, cruel and unyielding, gatherer of sins, of scars, but sunderer of virtue, of happiness. Despite what I learned, what her father did, I couldn't hate him. I remember the kind gentleman he was. The man who gave me candy when I got a flat tire on my bike. How he made his tools talk as he worked, each in its own voice. The man who took us fishing on weekends when Dad had to work. But then, I only knew him sober. I learned, like me, he was a man with scars. Though not of the flesh... No, his scars had been carved into his psyche by the tender blade of a priest's touch. He drank to numb the pain of those wounds, and when he drank, those scars consumed him. He lashed out violently. When he sobered, when he saw what he had done, shame and regret ravaged him. Pain he also needed to drink away. A cruel, spiraling storm. The morning of the fire, he greeted the dawn with a shot of Jack. She came downstairs ready for school and found him in one of his rages. It was the first time he had beaten her. Her mother stopped it that time, but she knew from experience that now that his demon had seen her, it wouldn't let her go. More beatings would follow. 
Her mother had stayed because she loved him, because she knew his past and saw through the ugliness of the scars to the man deep inside. The man he was. She couldn't abandon him, not to the demons that were claiming him one drink at a time. All that changed the moment he took their daughter, the person he loved most in all the world, by the neck and threw her against the wall. She knew what it meant. Another part of the man she loved was gone, claimed by the demons. Their daughter was no longer safe. They needed to run. Her mother planned to pick her up after school, before he got off work, and drive to her grandma's a few blocks away. It was too close. They couldn't stay there, but they could get money, food, and then disappear. To where I don't think even her mother knew. But, as fate would have it, he was fired for coming to work drunk. He returned home to find her mother on the phone, saw the suitcase waiting by the door, overheard what she was planning, and enraged, broke her mother's neck. She told me later that he was sober when he got home. He told her that her mother had gone shopping and wouldn't be back until later. He made supper from scratch, pepperoni and black olive pizza, her favorite. Gave her chocolate ice cream with sprinkles for dessert, snuggled with her on the couch and watched Care Bears on the VHS until she fell asleep and put her to bed. Then he started drinking. I can't say what thoughts crossed his mind, what venom the demons used, but sometime after midnight, he snuck into her room, slit her throat as she slept, and lit the house on fire. The police found his body beside his wife's in a corner of the basement, a single gunshot wound to his temple, her with three shattered vertebrae in her neck, taken by his demons. But demons aren't so easily killed. They move from host to host, passed on by hate and violence. Being drunk, he didn't cut his daughter's throat as deeply as he thought. The pain jolted her awake, but the blood, the sight of his face looming over her in the darkness, the knife in his hand, paralyzed her with fear. She couldn't move, even as the flames spread all around her. I pulled her from her bed that night, dragged her through the fire as far as I could, but I couldn't take her far enough, not to free her from the nightmares he gave her, the demons. Her song quiets. I strain to hear each lingering, haunting tone, desperate for her to stop, unable not to listen. It's our song, our story. I wipe the tears from my eyes. My fingertips probe the edges of the scars of that day. Scars that painted every moment of my life since. That made every day at school a living hell. For both of us. With her parents gone, her grandmother took her in and wanted to move away. It was a small town. Her grandmother thought that going to the same school, seeing the same kids, all of whom knew everything about what had happened, would be unthinkable. The therapist argued differently. She said that throwing her into a new environment right now would be even worse. She argued that children she knew would be more understanding, lend her support and sympathy she'd never receive at a new school. But more than that, after seeing us in recovery, how much her and I needed one another. That separating us, especially now, would cause irreparable harm. And the therapist prevailed. It was her grandmother that first taught her the piano outwardly because she landed on top of me and had been spared the touch of molten polymer, the only scar she carried was the white jagged line across her throat. But inside was another matter. The piano became her voice, her way of channeling the scars etched into her soul. Her pain shaped each note into something beyond beautiful. A passion, a language all her own, one that reached deep into the hearts of all who heard her a cry that eventually brought her to Carnegie Hall, Moscow, Sydney. But in those early years, when romance first beckons the young to dance, it was only her and I. She, the star around which my world revolved, my one true and only love. And I, her dearest friend. As we entered high school, music soothed her invisible scars. 
but nothing could erase the marks carved into my flesh. Her sophomore year, a skilled violinist who wore no scars inside or out moved to town. A kind-hearted prodigy her tutor introduced her to, who played with her. She spoke of him often, how he flipped his head when his hair fell over his eye, the way his hand held the bow between his thumb and forefinger, how his eyes changed with the mood of the piece he played and how beautifully their music melded together. I smiled each time, ever there, ever supportive. Despite the change in her voice, the sparkle of her eye, and the little smirk that squirmed up her cheek when she thought of him, despite the burning ache as it always sparked in my chest. More than anything, I wanted her to be happy. I knew, scarred as I was, I could never be what she wanted, the person she deserved. But he could, if only she found the courage to speak to him. But I knew the scars she carried, faded but not gone. I knew, crippled as she was, such courage was beyond her. And so one day after school, as he sat on the floor in the hall going over his homework, I flopped down beside him. Hey. Blinking, he glanced up from his algebra. Oh, hey. Algebra. That actually worked. I was never any good at math. I unzipped my backpack, tugged out my own textbook, and turned to the same lesson. Sorry, I was having trouble with number four. I unfolded the sheet I had tucked between the pages. Do you mind? I glanced up just in time to see his eyes dart away from my missing ear. Licking his lips, he leaned over to look at my work. No, not a problem. He studied my paper for a few seconds, then reached over and tapped the tip of his pencil in the middle of the problem. You got the value for X right, but... Then you got it confused with why. That's why your values are messed up for the next section. Oh. I stared down at the page in disbelief. He was right. I could see that now. But it meant redoing the entire assignment. Thanks. No problem. He tossed me a nod and went back to his own work. Ugh. It would take me all night to redo it all. I jammed the paper back into the textbook and closed the cover. I didn't even want to think about it anymore. It wasn't why I was here anyway. You have a secret admirer. Without turning his head, he glanced at me out of the corner of his eye. I'm touched, really. But I'm afraid my heart belongs to my music. He finished with the slight hint of a laugh. I met your duet partner. The words burned like vomit in my mouth. He raised his head. Really? Yeah. I swallowed hard. She's crazy about you. She's just too shy to make the first move. The next day, he spoke to her. I'll never forget that day, watching from my hiding place, seeing the color rise in her cheeks when he called out her name, the way she bit her bottom lip to hide her smile, pulled the book she was carrying tight against her chest, and turned around. The slight tremble of her hand when he asked her out. How she swept her hair over her ear when she nodded. All of it. It was like swallowing knives. And the deep ache it tore through my gut. The crushing emptiness destroyed me. I was, as ever, her friend. But as they drew closer, her time with me diminished. Until we barely spoke at all. By graduation, we were all but strangers. A few years later, I received a wedding invitation. I didn't go. For years, I lost track of her entirely. Without her, my life had no direction. I dropped out of college, worked a string of odd jobs for a temp agency. I was a delivery driver, worked manual labor, whatever paid the rent. But life lost its meaning, its flavor. I stopped calling home, ghosted my friends, they were reminders of the past, of her, of what I did, what I lost. I didn't need them, didn't want them, or anyone. I just wanted to be left alone. So I stopped hiding my scars, my missing ear. I figured no one wanted to associate with Freddy Krueger. It worked. I took lunches alone, 
No one talked to me who didn't have to, and I was left alone with my pain. In a strange way, I suppose that's what launched my career. The agency had an opening for a mover at the art museum. The job was simple enough, haul crates up to the third floor and help the artist set up as asked. As usual, the other temps did what they could to avoid me. When lunch came, I ate alone. Out of sight and out of the way, but still there. Still ready to work when lunch ended. Which, that day, meant a paint bucket shoved between a potted plant and a column. I sat down, unwrapped my sandwich, and a voice asked, Mind if I ask you something? My hand froze. Sandwich halfway to my mouth, I turned my attention to a short balding man in a white suit. The artist. My boss for the day. He flashed me a tentative smile and lifted a camera to his pudgy cheek. Picture? No. I turned back to my sandwich and took a bite. I was not interested in my scars becoming his muse. Oh dear. Scratched the stubble on his chin, waddled over and pulled up a paint bucket beside mine. Sorry. I didn't mean to offend. You didn't. I took another bite. Yet. Well, good. He sighed, sat down, and propped his camera on his knees. Have you looked at my exhibit? No. But I had. Photos of butterflies and flowers, all close up, all of some minute aspect that hinted at some deeper meaning. A part of me, a long forgotten part, wanted to ask about those meanings what nuggets of wisdom he saw behind them, but mostly, I just wanted him to go away. Undaunted, he waved his arm across the room. Tell me, what do you see? I didn't answer. I wasn't sure what game he was playing, but I strongly suspected that this was just some roundabout way to snap a picture of the freak, something to add to his exhibit. After a long, awkward moment, he stood and laid his camera down on the bucket. I'll tell you what, I don't want you moving anything else today. Instead, I want you to take this camera and photograph the process. A smile twitched at the corner of his mouth. Boxes, your comrades, whatever you find interesting. With a wink, he turned, folded his hands behind him, and waddled back across the room and out of sight, whistling as he went. I watched him go before going back to my sandwich, eyeing the camera as I ate. Whatever I find interesting. Nobody ever cared what I thought, what I felt. Not since she left. I reached down and picked up the camera, a far cry from the Polaroid I had as a kid. I flipped it forward and gave the back a once-over. Digital. High-end, but just a few buttons seemed simple enough to operate. One of the other temps lumbered by carrying a ripped box. I zoomed in on his face, the deep lines carved into his skin and tired eyes, and snapped a picture. Then another of his hands, his dry and cracked knuckles, next a gash down his thumb where he must have nicked himself with the box cutter. All intimate stories that needed to be told. But once I started, I saw more. A sweat-stained ball cap tossed on top of a pair of worn-out gloves. A bunch of the others on break, laughing at a dirty joke. Dozens of pictures. Hundreds of stories. The artist loved them, said I had the gift. I had no idea what that meant, but he took them and, after getting them printed, blown up and arranged, showed them as part of his own exhibit, but under my name. My chosen mask a fabricated name plucked from my past. And just like that, I became an artist. The first picture I took that day sold for $325,000. Others followed. Years passed, along with my benefactor, mom and dad. But my art, my prestige only grew until at last I had an exhibition of my own in Paris. Only an hour's drive from my own private chateau and vineyard where I lie now. Her song crescendos like rain at the height of the storm, all but stealing the breath from my lungs. The same notes that brought us together. The piece she composed herself. Her story, our journey. 
her soul and mine. The same outpouring that propelled her onto the international stage. The career that led her to the same city as my exhibition. At the same time. I couldn't bring myself to attend her concert any more than I could reveal my true identity. I couldn't stand seeing her, hearing her soul bleed into my ears, knowing her heart belonged to another. No, my face was never meant to stand in the light, especially not hers. Even there, among my own work, I remained unknown. My name a pseudonym I plucked from the past. I, the mysterious artist, the master who stood in shadow. Oh, I attended every showing, but in secret, always lurking, always listening. I had no choice. I needed their praise. I needed to hear it with my own ear, just to pile on the scale, to balance the void in my chest, the voice that called from the inky blackness of her absence, the only whisper that spoke only of my worthlessness, of how even the price of flesh, of heart, wasn't enough to win her or anyone's love. And so, I was there, lurking, listening for nuggets of worth to toss on the scale when the guide passed by one of my pictures, one I had named Scars. A black and white print, a rag doll sitting in the rubble of a shelled out building as if some little girl had set her there and ran off to play. The only color I added, the blood spray across the doll's face and dress. He gave his speech, told the admirers where I had taken the photo, a snippet about me being burned in a fire, a stirring warning about the horrors of war, and the group moved on. All of them, except one. Her. She stood there transfixed. Her gaze jumped between the picture and the plaque. The name I had given myself. The first name, our hometown, and the last, her grandmother's first name. Her eyes widened. It can't be. I shifted in the shadows, numb, not sure what to feel. She didn't look like the woman in the posters, even less like the girl I remembered. Her eyes carried the weight of time, of sorrow, though the scar across her neck was nearly invisible now. Had I not known, I wouldn't have seen it at all. Tears shone in her eyes, a sharp breath cut across the murmur of the tour group further on, and her hands jumped to her face. But I didn't move, not until she turned her head, until I noticed the pale mark around her finger, where her wedding ring no longer sat. Molten lead boiled up from the void in my chest. I couldn't bear it. Not that. Not her. Not after everything she had been through. I stepped closer. The soft click of my shoes echoed off marble floors and walls. Her hands dropped from her face in a self-conscious jerk as I stopped beside her. Who would have thought a silly photograph could hit so hard? She laughed, despite the tremble of her chin, and dabbed a tear from the corner of her eye, never glancing my direction. That man is a master. Her voice cracked a fracture that shattered the ice encasing my heart. So much pain, so much regret. I needed to help her, heal her scars. And so, clearing my throat, I pushed out my chest and folded my hands behind my back. He's complete rubbish. No talent at all, if you ask me. Juvenile twaddle. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched her head turn in my direction and sniffed. This place has gone to the dogs. For a moment, she just stood there, eyes wide, mouth gaping. Then a single tear trailed down her cheek and she fell into my arms. In that moment, I knew why Saul spread his warmth and light upon the earth. For the flower, I would never allow us to be parted, never allow another to hurt her again. I would do anything sacrifice anything so she would never suffer again. I would be whatever she needed me to be, 
become whatever it took, do whatever I must for her, so she'd never hurt again, no matter the cost. A long beckoning chord moans from the piano downstairs, and her song falls silent, a deep piercing silence broken only by the footsteps of time. Tick, tock, but it's over for tonight. I take a shuddering breath and focus on the door to await her return. After releasing me that day in the gallery, we spent the remainder of the day together and then the evening. She talked and I let her. She told me of her career and marriage, how wonderful it was in the beginning and how it soured as her fame spread and his stalled. The travel fame required and the toll it took on their marriage. How eventually, alone and feeling abandoned, he strayed. My heart bled for her as she told me of the pain it caused, but try as she might, she couldn't stop loving him. But she had forgiven him, tried to make it work. However, in the end, only the night before our meeting, he told her it was over, that he had chosen the other woman, because she was there. As we talked, evening became night, and night became day. She told me she had canceled her tour, how the nightmares, once vanquished, had returned, all of them, her father's face looming out of the darkness, the flash of moonlight on his blade, the searing pain across her throat, visions that kept her from sleep except with the aid of medication. Fear haunted her every thought, and now her husband, her love, her support was gone. She needed time to heal, somewhere away from the spotlight. In a broken whisper, she confessed that she had no idea what brought her to my exhibition. Then she took my hand, smiled, and said, But I'm glad I did. My heart soared. I showed her my estate, told her she was welcome to remain as long as she wished. I would keep her secret. Always. She accepted, and in the weeks that followed, arm in arm, we toured much of France. She began to smile again. For a time, we found a sort of happiness in one another's arms, though her heart remained with him. But then one day, months later, she received a text from him. Her eyes sparkled, her cheeks flushed. He wants to give it another try. Shaking, she held up her phone to show me. The dark, gaping maw on my chest ripped open. I knew what it meant. It was a cycle as predictable as Sol and Luna's, as unyielding as the ticking of my grandfather's clock. She would leave me, go to him, taking my soul with her. And he, in turn, would shatter her exactly as before. I watched her hands tremble as she wrote her response, the eager smirk that twisted across her lips. But I hadn't forgotten the broken woman in the gallery, nor the vow I made that day, to end her suffering, a vow that roared from the pit in my chest with a voice that shook my very bones, a vow I could only keep by breaking it at the cost of my soul. Mist pours in the gap under the bedroom door. A thin, translucent shape passes through the wood. I lie frozen as she hovers past. Her ghostly eyes lock with mine. Her face twists into a visceral scowl, the same expression she wore years ago when I bathed in agony so that she might be spared. When I took her sleeping pills, crushed them, stirred the powder into her coffee along with the sugar and when she fell asleep, carried her to bed. I sat with her, listening to her breathe, watching her chest rise and fall, slower and slower, until something went wrong. Her eyes burst open. She jolted up, gasped, and I was forced to finish her father's work with the only tools I had on hand, my very small pocket knife and grim repetition. The shock on her face, the pain, horror that hardened to ice, the cold fury of trust betrayed, a piercing glare that stole the breath from my lungs then, just as it does now, an expression made all the more horrifying by her ghostly countenance. 
She doesn't speak, not until she reaches my grandfather's clock. Then she turns, taps on the glass, and moans, Three more years. Her skull twists into a demonic smirk, but then the first rays of dawn peek over the horizon and she vanishes like a forgotten dream. Shivering, wet with sweat, I roll over. Three years. I whisper the words as a lover into the shriveled ear of the woman lying beside me. Until what, I don't know. But as I stroke her cheek, as her dry skin rasps against my knuckle, I can sense her spirit again. Somewhere deep inside her dried out husk. Waiting for Luna to rise once more. Gently, ever so gently, I kiss her bony temple and whisper, My love, I've given you everything. My flesh, my happiness, my honor, and my soul. All to end your suffering. A few of her hairs lay loose on her pillow. I pick them up one by one, carefully brush them in with the others, and glance at the jagged rip I sawed into her throat. Then, staring deep into her empty sunken eye sockets, I find the courage to speak. What more could I have done? Why do you torment me? Why here? Why now? Will we not have an eternity together? But I already knew what she intends for me. An eternity of torment at her hands. My own private hell. I shake my head and press my lips to hers. Even after all this time, she doesn't understand. Hell is a price I'm willing to pay. I hope you enjoyed Transgressions, written by Dirk Stevens and performed by Paul J. McSorley. You can find more of Dirk Stevens' work on our very own network. And don't forget, there are still over 120 episodes of Fear from the Heartland in our archives. I strongly suggest you check them out. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. ha 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 ha.